no favoritism with him. Thank you, Hilda, for reading. Uh, it's a pretty short passage, um, but nine verses, but probably way too much to really talk about everything in detail because there's just so many implications that come out from these verses. So I'm going to try my best to um, help us just think about it um, and see some principles and what this these verses might mean for us, and it's a good thing that, you know, we have Harry doing the different seminars over the year. I, I think these are things that we're going to have to continue to think about, um, and yeah, I'm looking forward to that as well. I remember overhearing someone's advice to parents, and he said, like, oh, if you're a parent, don't read more than one book a year or something on parenting, because the more you read, the more you're going to feel like a failure. Um, you know, there's so many books and, and theories and methods on how to raise good kids or you know, how to be successful parents and how to, how to, how to do your sleep training and all, all, all of these things. Uh, there's so, so many experts, so many opinions, um, not just on parenting. Uh, we all know that people have something to say about everything, really, um, how, to, how to dress how to spend your free time, how to spend your money, how to invest, you know, all sorts of, how to find the right partner, all, all sorts of things. And like Adi started the service, he, he, the Bible has something to say about everything as well, because the Bible is concerned about the way we live all of our lives in Jesus. Um, the Bible isn't just wanting to talk to us about church. It's not just wanting to talk to us about Sundays. It's really wanting to talk to us about Monday through Saturday. Uh, Paul, in the book of Ephesians, he's already been concerned about how Christians are Christians outside of church, how Christians are Christians in their marriage, uh, and today how Christians are Christians as children, how Christians are Christians as parents, and how Christians are Christians at work. And the way the Bible expects Christians to be Christians in all of these different spheres, um, I believe is extraordinarily sensible. It makes a lot of sense, but it's also very radical and countercultural. And we're going to see that, hopefully. Um, the passage right before this, a few weeks ago, if you weren't here, we talked about the dynamic of submission and love in marriage. And we said the wife voluntarily gives herself up to submit to her husband who, in love, he gives his own life up for the beauty and glory of his wife in Jesus. And we said this is actually quite a revolutionary thing because, in, because giving women the power to choose to submit to their husbands was unheard of in Paul's time. And it also overturns our modern tendency to think of marriage as a product or a consumer experience that we buy into to enhance our lives. And, you know, like if we, it's like Netflix or Disney Plus, we just sort of move on to the next subscription if it gives us a better deal. Uh, but it's also extremely sensible because we all know true love does involve commitment. It's what we're all looking for, and only do we really find it in the Bible's explanation of marriage. So, today... The underlying message, when we come to family and the workplace, and, and hopefully, like I said, we'll see that it's quite very sensible and yet, and yet radical and countercultural. the underlying message of today's passage is that in Jesus, we can joyfully obey and serve those who are put in positions of authority above us. So, as people who are, whether it be social or in lower positions, can joyfully obey and serve those who are put above us. And in Jesus, those with authority can lovingly serve and nurture those under their care for their best interests. So for the best interests of the ones that are under them and not their own. The children should obey and honor their parents. There's an order to the family. 
but parents should train and instruct their children for their good. Servants should serve their masters wholeheartedly. That's a social structure. But masters should treat their servants well the way that they would like to be treated. And Jesus is the key to all of this. So I'm going to pray, and we'll come to the Word. Lord, as we think about, yeah, just life and all the different relationships that we have in life, especially in the family and in the workplace as we come to this part of Scripture, um, help us to see how Jesus is the key for, for us to obey and also us to instruct and teach and nurture and serve those who have been placed in our care. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so let's look at verses 1 down to verse 4. We're going to look at the family first. Um, he says, Paul says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Now, in a moment, I'm going to touch on the fact that uh, I obey and honor are two different commands. Um, but when we think about obedience, every society in history, every society in history has taught to differing degrees that a child should obey their parents. That there, there, there is an order in the family. Um, you can be an atheist, you can be a moralist, you can be a Greco Roman philosopher. You, you know, we're, a lot of us are Asian, so we have a Confucianist sort of backgrounds. Um, it, virtually every civilization in history regards parental authority as important in creating a stable society. Order in the family leads to order in the community. Uh, and I think uh, civilization, people get that because it's been implanted in them in creation. We know that God has created the world, and He's created the world with order. He's created uh, social structures to have order. But the Bible teaches the relationship between parents and children, I think, in a really different way than to the world. And it says two things about children and parents, and it's, it says that a child's obedience to his or her parents is actually a part of a greater reality of a child's obedience to Christ. A child's obedience to parents is part of a greater reality of that child's obedience to Christ. And the second point is, which we'll come to later, that in order to facilitate this, in order to nurture this, parents are not to exasperate their children, but instead raise them up in the Lord. But let's, let's think about the children first. What does the Bible mean? when it says that a child's obedience is part of a greater reality of an obedience to Christ. It means that for children to obey their parents, or for children to be taught to obey their parents, isn't only done because that's the peaceful thing to do. It's not only done because it's the morally correct thing to do. It's done and it's taken seriously because it's the God-honoring thing to do. It's the God-honoring thing for a child to obey their parents. It's a God-honoring thing for a child to be taught to obey their parents. Um, there aren't many children here, um, but um, if you are a child, um, after all, I mean, as adults, we are still children of our parents, but obeying your parents is more than just obeying your parents. Obeying your parents is really about obeying Jesus. And so for most of us here who are parents, we need to frame the way we teach our children in that sort of framework. Every opportunity that we give our children to obey is an opportunity for us to help them obey Jesus. Of course, that, that means also that you can't give them opportunities to obey that are contrary to Jesus. Like you, you, you can't be giving them opportunities to obey that uh, are going to actually turn them away from Jesus. You know, to honor your father and mother is the fifth commandment. 
Sometimes the Ten Commandments are divided into two parts. Some people will divide it into like a four and six split. So the first four, they talk about God. The next six, they talk about people. Um, But the Jews regularly taught that the Ten Commandments are a five-five split, meaning the fifth commandment, honor your father and mother, belongs not in the category of how we uh, interact with people, but actually belong to the category of our duty to God. So uh, it is part of our duty to God to honor our parents. And and to sort of back that up, in the Old Testament, I won't read this, but in um, places like Leviticus and Deuteronomy, um, the law taught that a stubborn and rebellious child would be punished by death, which is absolutely extreme, or it sounds so extreme. But that's how serious God is about obedience to parents. Rebellion against parents was seen as a, a pretty tant, almost tantamount to rebellion against God in idolatry. The New Testament does basically the same thing. The New Testament condemns disobedience to parents. It says disobedience to parents is a mark of a fallen society that's given itself up to godlessness. And that's a remarkable thing for the, for the Bible to say. And it, and it tells us something about maybe... On one hand, the way many children are raised today, and it tells us something maybe even about the legislations that seek to handcuff parents' freedom and ability to teach their children to obey, especially on issues of sexuality and gender. But the Bible, of course, isn't saying that um, every child has to be taught to obey so that they could be they're, they're these perfect little angels. And, you know, if, if, your, if your child is, is not perfect, you should be ashamed of yourself. You're not a good parent or you're not a good Christian. Um, well, children are as sinful as any of us, of course. And really, the responsibility to navigate that sinfulness with grace is going to rest on the parents, and we're going to get to that soon. But we have to also realize that the words obey and honor aren't always going to be the same thing. There are times where to obey your parent um, or the way that a child is taught to obey their parents isn't actually the most honorable thing. We always have to place obedience in the context of the ultimate lordship of Jesus. Children obey their parents because of And children obey their parents in submission to, ultimately, Jesus. They have to be loyal to Jesus as part of their loyalty to their parents. Um, In in Jesus, children can submit to and obey their parents. We can teach this. Children can be taught to submit to and obey their parents, even if those parents aren't perfect all the time because we can actually teach them about Jesus. We can teach them that in Jesus, there is a loyalty to Jesus that is reflected in our loyalty to our parents, in our obedience to our parents. But if there are parents who should be disobeyed, if there are parents who should not be obeyed, because in Jesus, we know that what those parents instruct or teach is wrong and evil, then the Bible does not force children and it does not force us to be helpless victims of evil and abuse because we know our primary loyalty is to Jesus. Now, there comes a point when children become adults, and most of us here are adults. And as adults, you have to learn independence. You have to learn to be able to make your own decisions. And that mean, that will mean that at some point, children re- will have to learn whether to obey 
or not to obey. They will have to learn what is the most God-honoring thing to do. Will it be to obey or will it be to not obey? And I think more than obedience, the real attitude that we needed that children need to learn is honour. Uh, obedience falls under the category of honour. Honour means respect. It means respecting a parent's wisdom enough to seek and heed their advice wherever possible. And, and especially when you reach an age where, you know, as an adult, I need to make my own decisions, uh, you can still do that and yet respectfully disagree with them. You, you can reach a point where you can say, I, I, I want to respect you, I'm going to heed your, uh, I'm going to seek your advice, but I'm also going to be able to communicate with you why I can't take that advice in the way that you gave it to me, because in the Lord, I don't think that is right. Uh, of course, honouring parents also means caring about them. Um, you know, especially as adults, visiting them and talking to them, um, caring for them financially. All of that falls under this umbrella of, as children, are we able to do the hard, hard work of serving our parents in such a way that honours them even in all of their weaknesses, even in all of their imperfections, as, as parents who screw up, as parents who are selfish sometimes, as parents who have emotions and lose control, um, as parents who grow old and frail. Do not allow yourselves as children of your parents, or, and do not allow your children to grow into children who are comfortable with disrespecting their parents or disrespecting later on their parents-in-law by neglecting them or ignoring them or failing to communicate with them. Instead, children should be honouring their parents. Honouring their parents by choosing to do what is good and right in the Lord, communicating respect and gratitude. Now, for some of us, maybe the first thing we need to do in order to honour our parents well is not obey them, but forgive them. Some of us can't obey our parents. Some of us feel like we're in a place where we really can't honour our parents because the relationship that we have in our parents is broken. There are things that, the way that they've raised us, the, the way that they spoke to us, that have made us sort of insulate ourselves and, and be unable to honour them really in the most deepest parts of our hearts and our lives. But forgiveness, unless you can forgive them, unless you can Understand that God has forgiven you and, and therefore freed you, not just from your own guilt, but from the oppression of sin in our lives, then unless we can forgive our parents, even for their own imperfection as parents, as children who grow up into adults, we will still be children who are enslaved and controlled by the failures of our parents. But we'll be unable to truly honour them because in our hearts we haven't really realised that Jesus has called us to honour our parents as we honour Him, understanding that He has saved us and freed us. Uh, forgiveness actually leads to the ability to love and honour our parents without bitterness and resentment. And I say this maybe because personally, this is one of the hardest things I've, I've had to do in my life. Uh, typical Asian parents, mum and dad, had my life planned out for me, as immigrants, they wanted to live out the Australian dream through me. And I know they did it because they loved me, but it planted resentment and fear in my heart. Resentment because I never felt like I really knew who I was. And fear because I was always afraid that I would disappoint my parents and their dream. 
And it took lots of time, it took lots of prayer, it took courage, and ultimately it took the gospel, working in my heart and in my parents' hearts to be able to forgive, to be able to come to a place where we could communicate what we really felt without bitterness, without hate, uh, without this overwhelming sense of, I need to convince you, I have to force you to obey, and it's taken lots of time, and it's still a work in progress. So here's what I wish my parents had known earlier on. Verse 4, fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Now, I've only been a father for a year, but, um, but not only has my baby exasperated me <laughs> already, but I have probably exasperated my baby too. The only difference is she just doesn't know <laughs> it was me. Yeah, like she just thinks that she's hungry and uncomfortable and bored when it's really her dad uh, being annoyed and lazy and wanting to sleep. Um, she just doesn't know it yet. But here's the interesting thing about the Bible's command to parents. And, and I know it says fathers, but I'm saying parents because um, parenting involves both mom and dad. And uh, Paul says children should obey their parents and honor their father and mother, uh, not just one. The Bible's command is special because in the Roman world, children were considered possessions. Children were objects. The head of the household, fathers, had complete control over his children as his personal possessions. Meaning, as possessions, the father could legally and rightfully sell children, sell his own children off as slaves. He could make them work in his fields. He could take the law into his own hands. He could punish them as little or as much as he wanted to the point where it was completely fine for a father to inflict the death penalty on his own child. You know, historians say that one of the ways this sort of authority was abused was um, often little boys were preferred as children over little girls. Maybe they could grow up and be a bigger part of society maybe. And so it was common practice that when a girl was born, often um, families would leave the little girl to die. And it was sort of normal. Christians would go and rescue these children and raise them as their own. So, so Paul is writing in a time where parents had absolute authority over their children as their possessions. They, children were the parents to do with whatever they wanted. I think today we, also, we have a problem on the opposite side where children have absolute authority over their parents um, and, and maybe even our society encourages that. But the Bible says no to both of those. The Bible says no. Children aren't the possessions of parents to do with how, whatever they want, and children aren't the possessions of themselves to do with whatever they want either. Because the Bible really says that children are the possession of God. See, if children aren't possessions of parents, children aren't yours to live out your fantasies. Children aren't yours to use as an emotional bucket to just lash out. Children aren't yours to neglect, and children aren't yours to overly control. Children aren't their own possessions to do with themselves whatever they want. Children are God's possessions and therefore need to be raised and nurtured in a way that honors God. Paul says, don't exasperate your children. The dictionary says to exasperate means to infuriate or provoke to anger. And I'm going to borrow from someone who wrote a commentary on the book of Ephesians to help us understand what this means. He says, to, don't exasperate your children. It's like saying this. It's like saying, don't force unreasonable demands on your children. Understand that they're children. Don't force unreasonable demands on them. Don't employ severe or relentless forms of discipline. 
Don't be inconsistent or unfair in the way you treat them. Don't speak to them in constant criticism or uh, humiliation because treating children in this way creates adults who are filled with resentment and anger and frustration that they may never be freed from. You're creating children who are always going to be children inside, traumatized children, filled with resentment and anger and frustration. Now, I know it's selfish, but there are many times when, as parents, we wish our children would be a finished product. We wish that our parents would just don't understand, like, come on, like you're, uh, you're a year old, <laughs> just sleep through the night or something like that. But seeds don't sprout into trees in a day as much as we would like. And so to really raise a child, to nourish and nurture a child is a long-term investment. It, it means going through all of the ups and downs. It means going through all of the, this is the stage of life that he's at. This is how much they understand. Uh, this, is, this is something that needs to be stopped. This is something that needs to be instructed and changed. It means knowing them. It means learning their needs. It means learning the sort of children and personalities they are. As children. It, it means learning as, as parents how to facilitate their growth in that stage of life. It means watering them. It means fertilizing them. It might mean protecting them from the wind. And it also might mean exposing them to sunlight. Now, now when we spoke about husbands and wives, you said one of the key principles within that relationship of marriage is that each spouse should make it their mission to outdo the other one in the way they submit to and love and serve each other for their growth. The, the husband should love his wife, so that she might be presented as holy and blameless in the Lord. In the same way, if parents are expecting their children to obey, wouldn't it be much easier, wouldn't it be much, so much more loving for children to obey their parents' instructions in a context and an environment where those instructions are sensible, and clearly explained, and consistent, and given within a context of trust, where, where it's not emotionally charged, where, where children don't have to be afraid. Someone said, um, to nurture and raise and bring up a child in the Lord, in the instruction and teaching of the Lord, you need to do two things. You need to have disciplined love and loving discipline. Disciplined love is love that gives abundantly to meet the needs of the child that they would grow, but it's disciplined enough so that it doesn't indulge them. It's a love that teaches and instructs what is good in the Lord. But loving discipline is, a, is teaching those boundaries and teaching those um, instructions in a way that doesn't confuse, that isn't based on how mom and dad feels on the day, that isn't random, that's firm, but gracious and kind and self-controlled. Discipline that upholds what is good with love. And when we, and when we do that, I think, as parents, when the time comes for our children to be independent, or grow old enough to face the really big problems of life, like anxieties or fears or failures, you know, all the worldly temptations, struggling with alcohol or with broken relationships um, or, or drugs, or, you know, all sorts of things, or, you know, what to do with their career. Um, they're going to need a foundation of both what is right and wrong. They, they're going to need to know what are the boundaries, what's right and what's wrong, but they're also going to need to know what, what's loving, what, what's... What's grace? What's forgiveness? And I think the only way you get both is through Jesus and His gospel. 
Because the gospel isn't about perfect children being adopted by God. The gospel is about sinful, wayward, rebellious children, orphan children being adopted into God's family. But it's also about a father who doesn't leave his children in the mess he found them in. He never leaves us in our sin. He takes off the old and puts on the new. Parents who make the gospel front and center in their hearts and model that to their children at home, I think is able to provide both loving discipline and disciplined love. Right, let's talk about the workplace quickly. Um, Paul says slaves, but when we say slaves, Paul is, is talking to Christian slaves, Christian workers out in the world, and these aren't the sort of slaves that we might imagine Um, sort of, you know, people who are ripped away from their home and forced into slavery, generally not. Uh, Generally, in Paul's time, slaves were, uh, I mean, this is before capitalism, this is before, you know, we had big businesses and, you know, the free market and all sorts of things. So, slaves were Paul's equivalent of contractual employment. Um, What people would do often is... People would sell themselves off into slavery, which sounds crazy, but in reality, for them, being a slave meant having stability in your workplace. You had, a, you had work. You had a place to go. You, you had a place to sleep. Uh, you had food regularly. People sold themselves off into slavery for stability of life. And, of course, slaves didn't have many rights and they did the really dirty jobs and the menial jobs and were treated like property and possessions. But, yeah, Paul isn't encouraging the slavery that, or, of what we know where we have, you know, people sort of ripped out of their homes and forced into slavery. And Paul is not saying, hey, if you're that sort of slave, you know, everything's fine, just be a good slave. Uh, it's a different sort of slavery. Anyway, Paul says... Verse 5, slaves obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, but as slaves of Christ doing the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly as if you are serving the Lord, not people, because you know that the Lord will reward each one for whatever good they do, whether they are slave or free. And masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and there's no favoritism with him. Paul is saying something really, really important here about our work. Paul is actually saying that all work, as crappy as it might be, is God's calling. As bad as you might feel about your job, as unhappy um, or or as um, lowly, we might think a certain job is, Paul is saying every single thing we do, all work is God's work. All work is God's calling. How can working an office job, being stuck in the office, staring at a screen nine to five, or working retail and dealing with, you know, annoying customers or designing a house be gospel work? How, How could collecting garbage or you know, or banking people's money, um, or playing an instrument. How, how could all of those things equally be gospel work, be God's work? They can, and they are. Because the gospel is about God redeeming everything in the world for His glory. The gospel takes everything that's in creation and says, this has meaning, because I am putting every single thing in the world under Jesus' feet. I mean, if we think about it, the gospel tells us that God creates order out of chaos. So, that, so any job that, take, that creates order out of chaos is God-honoring. It's gospel work, administration, management, planning, consulting. All of these reflect the character of God. The gospel tells us that God is creative. He designed the world and everything in it. He, he planned salvation to design and to create beautiful, wonderful things, whether it be artwork or music or homes or websites, is a reflection of God and His gospel. The gospel cares about truth and justice. It cares about kindness and compassion. It cares about 
all sorts of things, every job really points to the gospel. You know, Jesus came as a carpenter, the son of a carpenter. My parents would have said, oh my goodness, manual work, you know. Um, there, was, there was a sign, I went to tutoring college, college in, in high school, and the sign said, hey, if you don't study now, um, when you grow up, you're, when it's hot, you're going to be working in a place that's hot, and when it's cold, you're going to be working in a place that's cold. So you want to be the opposite. You wanna, when it's hot, you want to work in a place that has air con. When it's cold, you want to work in a place that has a heater. But Jesus comes as the son of a carpenter. He's out in the sun all day. He doesn't work in the aircon. He doesn't work in the cool, coolness of night. He, he doesn't. He redeems manual labor. He even redeems the role of a servant. He comes as a servant. He says, oh, I came to, be, I came to serve, not to be served. And, and he exemplifies it by washing his disciples' feet. He does the most lowliest job reserved for the most lowliest of servants. Every single job. Every single job reflects and honors the gospel. And I think I don't have time, so I'm going to breeze through four things. I told you this is too much. All right, four things. This changes how we treat people. We don't treat people a certain way as a result of their job. If you look down on or belittle or mistreat someone, even your kids (laughs) or even yourself, because they go into a certain career that's simple or easy or or not as great as you would have liked, then you have not understood the Bible. You haven't understood the gospel. Someone who knows Jesus will never mistreat or belittle people based on what sort of job they have or how much they earn. Secondly, it changes how we treat our own jobs. If every job or task is some form of gospel work, if it's supposed to be God's calling for our lives, that, that He is somehow redeeming the world through it, that He's reflecting Himself in our job, even if it's boring, (laughs) <laughs> even if we don't always enjoy it, then we can be thankful, no matter what job we have. And if your job is unfulfilling and you're not happy in your job, then please, yes, go get a new job, but learn to be thankful first. Thirdly, it changes how we treat our bosses. We have good bosses, we have bad bosses, we have bosses that we, and companies that we believe, yeah, we should give all our best for this company, but this company, I'm not really feeling it. But if you're in the company, if you're in the job, the Bible says, Serve your masters wholeheartedly. Why? Because you remember, you're not actually serving your master, your earthly master, you're actually serving Jesus. Our work is serving Jesus. We have to see Jesus, not just our earthly bosses. And if we do that, we'll free ourselves from unhealthy politics for self-gain, and we'll actually become someone that people want to employ and retain and promote. Fourth and finally, it changes how we treat our workers. If you're a boss, if you have people under your command at work, Paul places masters and servants on an equal footing. He says, masters, you, should, you better treat your servants how you want to be treated. Treat your servants in the same way because God is the master of both of you. Okay, so much more. But it boils down to this. In Jesus, we can obey and serve those who are put in positions of authority because of Jesus, while those in authority can serve and nurture those given under our care because Jesus is our master. The gospel tells us that Jesus is the king that became a servant, a son, the son that became an orphan, and the master that became a slave for our sake. All right, let's pray. Father, Yeah, it's just crazy. There's just too many things here. But the gospel really changes how we view all of life. It changes how we view our work. It it changes how we wholeheartedly serve in the world because we see you as our master. We, We see that we're serving you. And it also changes our family dynamic. It changes how we raise our children because we realize they aren't our own. They're not our possessions. They they are yours for us to instruct in the Lord that they might grow into people who know you, who aren't filled with resentment. And as children, we can obey and honor our parents as imperfect as they are. We can forgive them. 
and we can trust that you know what you're doing as our loving Father. Help us to see these things and, and, sh- and change our lives to, f- to fit the gospel. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.